Thank you for listening to Value Based Care Insights, a podcast by Lumina Health Partners. I'm your host, Shelly Janeja. The series is for healthcare leaders and organizations navigating the journey to value based care and the ever changing landscape of our healthcare industry. And boy, has it been true for the exceptional year of 2020 we've had and the one we are heading into now. Our goal in the series is to bring to you disruptive success strategies for healthcare organizations, leveraging our experience and having worked with some of industry's top experts and thought leaders. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to invite you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think about the episode and the questions that are top of your mind. With that, I'd like to welcome my co-host, Dan Marino, Managing Partner at Lumina and an Industry Thought Leader for Value-Based Care. Dan, welcome. Hi, Shelley. Well, Dan, we've been talking about the impact COVID has had on our healthcare industry, on our organizations, financially, and even having changed the delivery of care. We've talked about several trends that we've seen emerge in 2020 and one we are anticipating in 2021, whether it be telehealth or reimbursement for -for fee-for-service or value-based care contracting. I'm particularly excited about today's episode where we talked about anticipated changes in health care, especially policy changes that will be introduced by the new administration. I know this is a topic that's top of mind for many healthcare leaders. We talk about many shifts that we're anticipating as it relates to accountable care strategy, MIPS, provider reimbursement, or even enrollment in healthcare services. What are you seeing in the industry or talks related to this topic, Dan? Well, I think a lot of folks up until now have been really considering how do they get themselves through the pandemic and past the pandemic with all the vaccine, vaccines and vaccinations that you know, we're, we're working through. Um, they're also very focused, I think, on two things. One is how do we financially recover? Um, so spending a lot of time thinking about how they improve their operational performance and get their margins, get their budgets to kind of the, the pre-COVID levels um, that occurred some 12, 14, 18 months ago. Second to that, though, and you touched on it, is changes in the way care is being delivered and the way we're even accessing care. I think one good thing that that COVID did for us is it forced disruptions in healthcare in the way that, that care is being delivered through the use of telehealth, through the ability to screen and interact with patients differently. And I think it also, as we've talked about, forced the shift into managing the populations and the patients around the value of care being delivered, not just based on the number of patients that we're seeing within a clinic or within a hospital environment. Absolutely. And, you know, Dan, we've been talking about the impact and the need of using data and analytics to better understand the target populations and the value that's delivered through care or the cost of care in managing high-risk or medium-risk populations. And I think we've seen that come up even more during the COVID era, where there is a greater need to understand the characteristics of a population. Not only the health characteristics, but more and more we're getting into the social determinants of health as well. Right, absolutely. And, you know, again, I think it's what COVID has done is it forced us, and in particular healthcare leaders and hospitals and even physicians for that matter, to think about how we deliver care differently. I think they've, as we've entered into 2021, they've thought about, okay, well, what is the the trends going to look like? What are the big influencers? And I think that's guided a lot of strategy, right? So in many of the organizations that we've worked with, that I've interacted with, they all have their strategic focus based on the shifts in the environment, what they want to accomplish, how they improve their business strategies and so forth. But Understanding the trends and and kind of learning from your retrospective activities that have occurred, it's important, but that's not the only thing that's going to influence success of an organization. Policy shifts are critical to drive a lot of the strategy and to understand where we want to go as an industry, but also as an organization. And, And let's face it, 
the rules of the road, so to speak, in healthcare do change every time we get a new administration, every time we get a new president. We saw that with the Obama administration. Obviously, with the Trump administration, they had a little bit of a different focus. And I anticipate some changes in the Biden administration as well. So the policy changes taken into account with the environmental needs that are going to have to occur to improve our financial performance, as well as then the trends that we're seeing from patients from the industry. It's going to make 2021 a very interesting year for many of these hospitals, for many of the providers. Absolutely. And I think with the new administration on board, we're on, you know, yet again at the precipice of those changes. And I know talk of the town is what those policy changes would look like, whether it be for enrollment or reimbursement um, um, of various services and how that further pivots our care delivery models to align closer to the new policy changes. You, you're absolutely right. And I think that's why, Shelley, I'm particularly excited to have today our guest from the Medical Group Management Association, Molly Gelbert, who's the Associate Director of Government Affairs for MGMA. And if many folks don't know MGMA, Medical Group Management Association does a wonderful job in supporting physician practices, employed medical groups, and over the years has provided a lot of support on improving the financial performance of, of the whole medical group side of healthcare. Molly, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Dan and Shelley. Uh, it's great to be here. So Molly, as, as I mentioned, I think many of our listeners, I'm sure have worked with MGMA over the years. I know even in the early days when I was managing physician practices, a lot of the benchmarking activity, a lot of the insights that MGMA provided was fantastic in terms of helping me as an administrator really improve the financial performance of my medical group. But MGMA does a lot more than that. I know they've been very involved and influential in a lot of policy changes, or at least trying to influence some of those policy changes with the government, HHS, CMS, and so forth. Can you speak to a little bit about some of those, some of the activities maybe that you and your group do on behalf of of your members? Sure. So I think while people might be familiar with MGMA and familiar with their data and the benchmarking and physician compensation data and those sorts of tools, as you mentioned, we also have an advocacy department that's located in Washington, D.C., where we stay central to the policy discussion around healthcare and different policies that impact medical group practices. And so we work together and we work with Congress and the administration and other stakeholder groups to try to influence policy to the better of medical group practices. And central to our advocacy agenda and priorities each year is the sustainability of medical group practices and making sure that policies promote and permit group practices to continue to furnish care to their patients. Well, and, and that's great. And as you know, I made mention in some of my opening comments, it's important to have the, the business approach to, to begin to think about, you know, again, how do we want to improve the financial performance? But you sort of have to keep your eye on where the ball's going, right? And understand some of these policy changes that are going to occur and then begin to anticipate how it's going to impact the organizations and then begin to pivot. So one of them, and maybe we can jump right into it, President Biden has has signed a number of executive orders. I know one of them that he signed was to direct the Department of Health and Human Services to expand their ACA coverage, to kind of bolster Medicaid. There's a lot of discussion out there in terms of the growth and expansion of, say, a public option. What are some of the things that you're hearing or what's some of the hot news that's on Capitol Hill? Yeah, exactly. I think this is such an important topic, especially um, in the era of COVID, when we've seen economic disruption and we've seen patients that might have lost employer-sponsored coverage. So now we might have a larger uninsured or underinsured population. So I think that these coverage expansion efforts are important to make sure that patients continue to have continuity of care, can continue to see their providers and um, maintain their health. So as you mentioned, Biden signed an executive order 
uh, very early on in his presidency to create an open enrollment period in the ACA. And that was in response to COVID so that patients that might not have a qualifying life event can go in and um, access the market-based plans. So that was something that he's been talking about since he was a candidate for president, that he wanted to strengthen the ACA and expand coverage. So there's been some debate about what he'll try to accomplish through executive order, vis-a-vis -vis administrative action through HHS, once you know he gets his secretary confirmed and starts staffing up for CMS and, and all the various agencies. So that's that's one side of the coin. I think also, We'll see Congress, now that we have Democrats in control of both the House and the Senate by a narrow majority, but still, um, you know, Democrats um, in control of both chambers, to also see coverage expansion. And so one of the options that's been floated is this public option. And that can mean a lot of different things. But the gist of it is that it could create a choice alongside what current insurance options are available, such as marketplace, employer-based, Medicare and Medicaid, this would create another option so that you can essentially buy in and get coverage that way. And so the details really depend on what plan you're looking at, whether that's something administered by the marketplaces or Medicare, those details are something that haven't really been discussed in great depth yet. Well, but I wonder if when you think about the public option, and again, it's still in the early stages of this, but what I've been able to, what I've read and, and what I've been able to understand, I think there's a couple of two, there's two pieces that are out there. One, I think that what you've described is kind of the expansion of the exchanges and, you know, as, as a way then to offer another option to compete against the, some of the commercial plans that are out there. But a second is to almost create then a second type of a plan structure that's similar to Medicare that, you know, would allow folks to participate in it. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be Medicare, but for those that are under 65 and would allow for that level of a broad-based plan um, with the idea that you wouldn't necessarily pick or choose a plan based on the uh, exchanges, but there would be one public offering. Are, are you hearing something similar to that? Or is it, you know, is it a different type of a, a plan structure that they're discussing as of right now? Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's, that's sort of the other side of the coin where you could possibly have a Medicare expansion in a sense through a public option. So for example, one of Biden's priorities was also to lower the Medicare age. So to have Medicare age be, let's say 60. So one option that Congress could consider would be to essentially have a buy-in at 60. So rather than expand to 60 automatically, you could then open up Medicare to buy into it starting at 60. So it's kind of a limited public option combined with lowering the Medicare age. And so maybe you call that Medicare Part E or Medicare Part X, but it's it could be structured similarly um, as opposed to it being more private plan paced or something like that. So yeah, that's certainly another option we could see. And we haven't really seen many plans floated in Congress yet, but there were several that were introduced in the last session of Congress that incorporated a sort of Medicare expansion. So I certainly think we could see that again as well. So let, let me turn the discussion a little bit towards the ACOs. You know, over the last, what, 10, 12 years, maybe even a little bit longer, there's been a huge push by CMS to move Medicare patients into these accountable care organizations. And I think the Trump administration tried to take it one step further where they not only are incentivizing providers um, to help manage patients within Medicare patients, that is within an accountable care structure, but they also were providing a lot of incentives for the growth of Medicare Advantage. What are you hearing um, around where ACOs are going to go. I know some of the enrollment right now for ACOs into 2021 are pretty low. They've, they've not been as high this year as they have in the past. What are some of the things that you're hearing? Yeah, so this is another really great topic. And 
value-based care is something that has enjoyed bipartisan support. So it's, it's you know, the ACO program, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, that started with the ACA. So that was actually codified in 2010 as part of the ACA. And then five years later, we saw MACRA, which really strengthened value-based care, strengthened the ACO programs. So I certainly think we're going to continue to see focus on this. And what was interesting is at the very end of the Trump administration, Seema Verma, the former administrator of CMS, had articulated the need for a course correction in value-based care and the direction of CMS's innovation center. And she was expressing a desire to have more accountability and less carrot, let's say, so less financial incentive. And rather than encouraging just broad participation, she was emphasizing performance. So she wanted to see models that were achieving cost savings and then maybe phase out the models that weren't. So I think for those in the industry that want to amp up participation and that want to see this program continue to have pilots and tests to see what works, that was a little bit concerning. So now that we have a new administration, uh, we're still waiting to see who's going to head that up. You know, Biden has not picked a CMS administrator yet, and he certainly has not picked a head of the Innovation Center either. So I think what will be interesting is to see whether or not they kind of reverse that, that rhetoric and say, we're going to focus again on participation and let's say quality outcomes as opposed to just cost savings, since there's really a dual focus in the Innovation Center of quality and cost. But it's hard to say without having even, you know, the names of heads of the Innovation Center floated. But I could certainly see there be a return to focus on quality and participation and continuing to just test as we really are still somewhat in the early phases of this. If you consider how extraordinary the changes that, that have to be made in value-based care are, you know, I, I think you have to give providers some leeway to make those changes. So I think it's a little bit early to say we're going to stop models that aren't efficient. I think they need to continue to be tested and maybe modified. I agree with you. And especially when you look at the investments that the hospitals have made, um, the strategic partnerships that they've created, they've done this in a way of, of really supporting a lot of the you know, potential cost savings that would occur, but, but also to not only track quality, but to demonstrate good quality. And that doesn't happen overnight. And many hospitals and health systems have been, you know, investing tremendous amount of resourcing resources into, you know, achieving those goals. I think the other thing too, which is important to kind of understand is, is what the economic structure and the economic models would look like as we've seen within COVID, Certainly, in my opinion, COVID has really shown a lot of the limitations in, in straight fee for service and the need to manage patients differently, to, the need to incorporate data, to understand what's happening with the populations. It better, it, it better allows you to anticipate some of those changes and to get out in front of it and, and to manage those patients differently than you would otherwise. The economics around this, I think, are going to be an important driver for hospitals as they choose to either embrace or move into a different strategy. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And something we heard from members and group practices was that some of the payments under APMs and ACOs help create a lifeline when volume was down. So for example, if you have a model that gives you upfront per Benny per month payments and that creates a stable cash flow when volume is down. At the same time, maybe you're starting to get shared savings payments from participation in an ACO, and that can create, you know, financial um, cash flow when you don't otherwise have it. So I think that value-based payment can have more st stable pay uh, payments, even though traditionally you might not think of it that way. But I think in COVID, that, that's changed. And so some of our practices in APMs were saying how it really saved them and it it enabled them to be self-sustainable without having to take loans or, it, or that sort of thing. So I think that that's, it's a different way to look at value-based payments. So it, it does offer 
stability when you're not having the in in person patient visits. And there's also opportunity to get reimbursed for some of the care that you do outside of a traditional office visit. Like you might be able to do telehealth without the waivers that are in place now because the model has a waiver. Or maybe you get payments for care coordination that aren't available to traditional fee-for-service patients. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And what we found when we were helping organizations through some of the challenges, the financial challenges that they were having, you know, last, say, June, you know, May, June, July, we found the organizations that had these value-based care programs and contracts in place that focused on on not only managing some of the, the shifts in utilization, but managing the patients through the use of telehealth, through virtual care, they were still able to provide the service. So they met a lot of their quality and cost thresholds. And as you mentioned, and it's a great point, they were able to maintain a certain level of revenue because they were able to, to achieve those, those cost uh, goals and the, and the quality outcomes. I do believe, and maybe you can talk a little bit about where this is going to go. I do believe telehealth was, again, a real positive that came out of a lot of the COVID activities, because what it has done is it changed the delivery model. It changed the access model for patients. It allowed a different alternative for physicians to, you know, and APMs to treat patients with conditions differently than they would in the, in the traditional model. What are you hearing um, sort of on the, on the future of, of telemedicine, telehealth? So I think that there's definitely a lot more attention being paid to telehealth now. Um, if you look at utilization pre-COVID, it was very, very low, at least in the Medicare space. And now it's really soared. And I think it's important to recognize that vulnerable patient populations may have trouble coming into the office and that exists even outside of the pandemic. And I think that lawmakers, policymakers are starting to acknowledge that, which is really great for providers and patients. And so I, I think we could start to see some relaxation of the traditional Medicare requirements for telehealth. So what we hear from group practices is some of the, the most significant barriers for telehealth reimbursement outside of the public health emergency is these geographing, geographic and originating site restrictions. And so those require that a patient be located in certain areas. And so simply put, it's a rural area and they have to be located at certain clinical sites, except for certain limited circumstances. They can't be at their home, let's say. They have to be at another clinic and then have, you know, call a specialist, let's say, from that clinic in a rural area. So that's been extremely limiting. So there's been some impetus in Congress to alleviate some of those burdens for telehealth billing and to walk back on them. And I think it remains to be seen what will actually gain traction and what we'll see made permanent as opposed to um, extended, let's say, for a period of time after the emergency. I think there's a lot of interest right now in relaxing those requirements, but I'm not sure exactly what will remain permanent. Um, so there's a lot of different proposals floating around right now, and that goes from you know, condition-specific uh, flexibilities or you know, uh, maybe expanding beyond rural, but still outside of metropolitan. So I think there's still work to be done to come to a consensus about what flexibility should remain permanently. Well, and I think too, when you look at the level of reimbursement, you know, for the longest time they were reimbursing the same as a in-person visit, you know, clearly the costs associated with that, we did some research, you know, it's anywhere from 60 to maybe 80% of, of what an, um, an in-person visit would entail from a, from a cost perspective. But the benefits associated with this, I think are enormous. Not only are there great benefits to the patient, but there's quite a bit of a benefit to the providers as well, too. Um, so I think overall for the industry, you know, it, it certainly is a positive change. The other thing that I, I'd be interested in, in hearing your thoughts are thoughts on um, is, you know, we believe that telehealth and the movement into this whole digital health component of the access to healthcare is just the beginning. 
and the ability to, to kind of tap into, say, personal health devices and in, aggregate data from these devices through a virtual health or virtual care environment provides an enormous opportunity there. Um, are you hearing anything on the Hill at all around how maybe digital health would advance and how it can continue to support different models and maybe what that level of reimbursement would look like? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting, um, you know, potential outgrowth of all of this and things like remote patient monitoring. Medicare has covered that actually for a while, but because of some of the burdens with billing and various requirements and just lack of education, essentially, I think utilization has been really low, but I think we could see greater attention to those sort of related um, to telehealth type codes, so virtual care, the remote, remote patient monitoring, I think would be really neat and a really good way to benefit patients beyond just the in-person visits. I think that right now the focus is on telehealth and they're still trying to decide whether or not they should allow you know, audio only. Should telehealth mean a phone call or should it mean a Zoom or a video component? So I think that there will be more attention pay, paid to the type of services that you're talking about. But I think right now they're focused on, you know, the, the telehealth aspect. But I think that it's it's also incredibly important to look at some of the other innovative um, developments that are going on and to look at, you know, RPM or chronic care management, which, you know, involves uh, coordinating care with the patient kind of behind the scenes. So I think that there's been attention to that in the past, and I think we'll see it again. But but right now, I haven't heard too much about that either from the administration or Congress. But I do think it's a, an incredibly important topic. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, if you look at some of these, you know, these for-profit companies that are out there, they're investing a lot of money into these digital health components and the ability to connect that. So I think at, at some point, it's going to have to be addressed and sort of decided as to how it's incorporated into, into the model. So Molly, thanks again for your time today. This was great. And I'm sure our listeners enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. If, if healthcare leaders or some of our listeners are interested in finding out a little bit more on the latest policy issues, is there anything in MGMA that, you know, they can sign up for or maybe where you can direct them for additional information? Yeah, absolutely. We have a newsletter that's called the Washington Connection, and we put that out every week and it, anybody can sign up for it. It's only once a week or if there's some sort of breaking development, like um, a big rule drop or uh, congressional action. And um, so that just puts out basically a synopsis of what's most important to medical group leaders. And we don't spam you, it doesn't come out that often. And we just try to drill down on what's most important to this particular community and then maybe link to other information, but we try to distill that and keep it uh, very focused on the medical uh, leader community. So that's called the Washington Connection and that's available on our website and I can get you a link. That's great. So is it on MGMA.com? Yes. And if you go to MGMA.com backslash advocacy, there should be a link to sign up right there. Well, thanks again, Molly. This is wonderful. Really appreciate your time. You're doing some great work on behalf of the members and really the industry as a whole. And I'd love to have you back sometime, maybe in another six months or so to give us a little bit more of an update. I think once it becomes a little clearer in terms of where the Biden administration is going, I'd, I'd love to hear a little more of your insights. Yeah, that'd be great, Dan. Thank you so much for having me and for the wonderful conversation. So Shelly, Molly brought up some great points today that I think we really have to pay attention to. And as we've talked about, I think, you know, as, as organizations, as leaders are starting to manage through sort of the tasks and the specific challenges related to getting past COVID, um, you know, and I know a lot of them are focusing on the trends that are occurring we have to also keep attention, keep our eyes on the policy changes that are going to occur. That's going to influence quite a bit within these healthcare organizations and within the industry. Absolutely. I think, Dan, that's going to significantly, I believe, it, with this uh, new administration, really pivot the way, um, you know, we, we continue to evolve as an industry and how we design our access to care, 
how reimbursement of care influences the financial planning and sustainability of healthcare organizations. I also enjoyed one point Molly raised was there were a lot of changes introduced by even the past administrations, particularly in digital health and telehealth area, which really COVID propelled the expansion of the footprint of those services. Yet, as we reflect back, I think there is a continued opportunity for education on what those opportunities are, what those changes are. And I think that's going to have to be a continued focus this year as we not only educate our healthcare users, um, healthcare consumers, healthcare organizations on what the changes are or what the impact is, and really taking that a step further and even with the policy changes as well. As we've said time and time again, the more healthcare leaders can be informed, the more Mm -hmm. physicians can understand what's occurring within their practice, the, the quicker they can adapt to it and the quicker they will remain successful and deliver high quality care to their patients. We want to thank you for listening to Value Based Care Insights, a podcast by Lumina Health Partners. We at Lumina are your partners on the journey to value-based care and all the pivots and challenges our industry is going through. To learn more about us, visit us on LuminaHP.com. And if you found value in today's conversation, subscribe to us on all major podcast platforms, including Apple and Spotify. And don't forget to leave us feedback. Join us again, where we continue our deep dive into what lies ahead and invite conversations with several of our colleagues and industry thought leaders on new trends that are emerging on how we continue to navigate and thrive in this new normal. Until then, have a great day and stay safe.